All right. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Browning Counseling, Working with Latinx Clients. I am Aria Costa. My pronouns are she, her, and ella, and I am the Behavioral Health Equity Specialist at the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, housed at the University of Texas at Austin. For those calling in or in listening-only mode, I'm going to do a visual description of myself. I'm a light-skinned Latina with long brown hair. I'm wearing glasses and a red blouse. I'm very pleased to be your host for this webinar, where we will be discussing an integrative approach to working in a culturally responsive manner with Chickenex and Latinx populations and highlight tools related to browning your counseling. Thank you all for joining us today. We truly hope you'll find today's presentation engaging and helpful in your work. This webinar is brought to you by the South Mental Health Technology Transfer Center, an initiative founded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to provide free training and ongoing consultation to all professionals that serve individuals with mental health challenges. Our region is Region 6, covering the states of Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arkansas, Louisiana, and our tribal communities. The South Southwest MHTTC is a project of the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, which is housed at the School of Social Work at the University of Texas at Austin. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement, agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in this presentation are the views of our speaker only and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. Even though we're attending this event online and we're signing in from different locations all over our region and other parts of the country known as Turtle Island, the South Southwest MHTTC team acknowledges that we are standing in the traditional land of the tribes Alabama Cushara, Cado, Carrizo, Comecrudo, Coahuiltecan, Comanche, Kikapuli, Panapache, Tuncahua, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been and have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. We acknowledge the painful history that has brought us to reside on these lands, and we seek to evaluate the effects of settling colonialism and our participation in that process, searching ways for the healing of intergenerational trauma. We honor the indigenous caretakers of these lands and waters before us, the indigenous peoples today, and the generations to come. The MHTTC Network is always making efforts on using a firm and respectful and recovery-oriented language in all of our activities. Um, a language that aims to be strength-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing center and trauma responsive, inviting to individuals participating in their own journeys, person first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear and understandable, and of course, of course, consistent with our actions, policies, and products. All right, we have an amazing presenter with us today. It's Dr. Manuel Samarri. Uh, Dr. Manuel is the director and co-founder of the Institute of Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex Psychology based in Austin, Texas, where he conducts workshops, training, and teaches courses on issues related to Chicanex and Latinx wellness, cultural identity, mental health, and cultural revitalization from a Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex affirmative framework. Dr. Samarripa has presented at national and state level presentations and trainings in psychology and education on issues of Chicanx Latinx well-being, cultural responsiveness, social justice, decolonization and psychology, psychosocial factors of academic achievement and leadership. His publications focus on counseling, assessment, and teaching of Chicanx and Latinx populations. His 20 years of clinical experience includes working with individual adults, adolescents, couples, and families in community and education settings, rural and urban as well, from varied economic and cultural backgrounds. He's a licensed professional counselor and approved supervisor and received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in counseling psychology, his MS from Our Lady of the Lake in counseling psychology, and his BA from the University of Notre Dame in uh, psychology. Thank you so much, Dr. Manuel, for being with us today. I'll pass the mic over to you. Thank you, Adi. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for being here with us today. I'm, um, I'm happy and excited to be able to spend a little bit of time with everyone here 
both live and those that are going to see this on the recording to talk about a topic that, yeah, of course, you know, obviously very um, important to me uh, that I'm passionate about, that I've spent my career continuing to, to, um, to develop. And, uh, and I think, um, I think that uh, this is, this is a topic that continues to um, connect with more and more people, as we know, that our, our Latinx, Chicanx, our brown populations continue to, um, to grow and in our, in our communities. And, uh, and we still face some of the, uh, some of the challenges that, uh, that we have over the generations, which is um, as much as we have progressed in some understanding of our, of our people and our culture, there's still there's still a gap. There's still a lot a long ways to go, um, and uh, also in terms of representation, as well in the mental health field. Um, so, so there are a lot of reasons why I think that um, um, this is an important topic, and and I appreciate you all being here, as well. Um, that's why I like to call this um, you know this topic Browning Browning your counseling. Um, because there are still some um, some concepts in the field, which I'm going to get to pretty soon, that um, that are 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 solid, grounded mental health topics, uh, mental health concepts. However, um, we need to uh, they tend to only include uh, one perspective or one worldview, and so we need to expand. Um, what we have to work with and the tools that we have. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna share, start sharing my slides, and move this a little bit here. We go. Okay. So if you have any uh, any questions for me, of course we have the chat as Adi was saying. Um, However, you're, you're welcome to connect uh, with me directly if you'd like. At, uh, info, you can reach me at info at rasapsychology.org. Uh, um, and uh, you can visit our website as well. Uh, we always have our most updated information there, upcoming topics and uh, upcoming events. So if we were in person, um, this is how we would open. Yeah. These are scenes from previous events that we had when we would when we would meet in person prior to to COVID. But um, but I I like to put this up because even though we can't be in person um, right now, we are forming our own virtual circle with each other and. Uh, and that's kind of the model of how we, we do our work and the model of our, our discussion today, which is that we are all here together. We are all here coming with different experiences and knowledge. And uh, even though I'm the one speaking, um, I really do invite you at any point in time, if you have any questions or any comments, um, to please put them in the chat or the Q&A. And I will do my best to pause and check in I want to make sure that we feel as much as possible that we are in in a circle together with each other, um, and that um, and that uh, and that we know that um, we are sharing this space together. So um, the background behind me is is a, a poster from the nineteen ninety seven. Um, Chicano Psychology Conference that was held in Michigan State University. And so um, uh, I like to, to use this sometimes because um, that was one of the first Chicano Psychology Conferences that I attended a long time ago. Um, so that was a question in the Q&A. Okay. Let's... Let's see what we have next. All right. 
So one of the things that I have been talking about a lot of the times and exploring as a foundation to the work is um, this notion of brown wellness. Um, and it doesn't mean that our wellness is completely different than typical wellness models. Right? But what it means, again, is like everything else when we're trying to be culturally responsive is that um, we're trying to look at the pieces of our wellness that may be distinct or that we may need to emphasize that are is more culturally relevant. And, and so for us, um, there are at least three aspects that I feel that we always need to keep uh, in mind when working with uh, Latinx you know, populations. And that is issues of identity, cultural identity, ethnic identity. Um, family, familismo, community. Um, and I put family and community together because I know um, that, um, that for some of us, our, our, our families um, sometimes are not safe places. And so um, while I think the notion of familismo and collectivism is key to Latinx populations, I don't mean to imply that that is a necessary component like for our clients sometimes that they must always um, be connected to, to their family or certain family members if, if it's harmful to them. Um, but I still think that we can connect with and honor and facilitate that cultural pillar of familismo through the notion of um, chosen families, right? Or community or just the idea of collectivism, even if our own, our own family sometimes or families of our clients may not be safe. So we don't, so that we don't, um, you know, of course, traumatize or re-traumatize our clients or ourselves, but the notion of the sense of familismo can still be important for our clients. Um, it could just be applied in, in healthier ways. And the, the, the idea of spirituality, we know that uh, spirituality is different for each individual, each family. And so this is not about, again, also, it's not about imposing the idea of spirituality on our Latinx clients, or it's not about saying, you know, all Latinx clients have the same degree of spirituality, uh, but it is saying that if we take a step back and we look at the Latinx, the brown populations of our continents, uh, we still see that for a majority of our communities, spirituality still seems to be an important thread uh, of significance in varied ways, but still uh, an important thread uh, of our lived experience. So it's important enough to, I think, to always keep it in mind. We can think of these, these three aspects um, like um, similar to an assessment or an intake where we know that the, the things that we check in with, with our clients, not all of them are gonna be relevant or if they are not to the same degree, but they're important to have, right? It's important to check in, it's important to note. So that's how I look at these three aspects of brown wellness, that um, while some may not connect in the same way to the same degree with each client, each of these still um, run deep in the community in general. And so they are important to check in. Uh, it's important that we check in on these three aspects to make sure that we are culturally responsive um, in our work with Latinx clients. So those are, that's kind of um, a good place. I think I wanted to make sure that we start with this idea of identity, family, and spirituality. Um, and so one thing that we do know about, about ethnic identity is that it has been and can be a protective strategy, uh, having a healthy sense of cultural identity for our for Latinx clients um, to cope with some of the difficulties, um, particularly around prejudice and discrimination. Um, so identity is important. 
Um, a lot of the times, the difficulties in our families, we like to say our family wounds are also cultural wounds. Um, a lot of the unhealthiness that we'll talk about, <clears throat> not all of it, but more than we talk about, a lot of the unhealthiness in our families uh, are also a result from some of the cultural wounds that we've experienced over the generation, starting back from, from the invasion 500 years ago to immigration experiences, you know, last week for some of our families. Um, you know, we like to say that, um, you know, uh, over the last few years, we all know the, um, the experiences of some of the, our Latinx families um, coming to the United States in terms of the family separations, separating children from their parents and how devastating that has been. And I think some of you probably have done some work directly around that. Um, but what we like to say, of course, is that unfortunately, family separations is not a new thing for our population. Family separation started 500 years ago with the invasion and have always continued in one way or another. Um, it's just, um, this is just the latest iteration of these types of, of cultural wounds, right? So our family wounds, a lot of the times are also our cultural wounds. Um, and we're gonna, you know, we have to remember that uh, in talking about collectivism, familismo, that traditional ideas of what we like to call enmeshment may not be culturally a cultural fit for our, for our families. Um, and so I am gonna talk a little more about that as well. And the way we think about spirituality, the work that we do at the Institute is that um, we recognize the notion, uh, the importance of faith. We recognize for, for a lot of our people we recognize the importance of uh, religion and religio religiosity a lot of the times. Um, but for, for us um, honoring and recognizing that uh, at the same time, for us, we tend to look at the role spirituality has had over the generations in terms of um, a source of strength and resistance, uh, affirmation, as we said, and, and that, um, we talk about spirituality in the realm of um, some of the, the suffering and the injustice that our communities have faced um, can be a spiritual issue. Um, so, so that's kind of the way in which we look at these three areas. So uh, we know that for, for a lot of our people, we don't have such a great history with um, modern day therapy, right? Um, we continue, as I mentioned at the beginning, to have a legacy of disconnection and stigma, a lack of representation. And so that has hurt our community. Um, one of the things that I do like to, to always, always mention when we talk about um, the stigma of mental health treatment and seeking out mental health services in the Latinx and Brown communities. Um, one thing that I always want to just make sure that, that I say is that, um, of course, we all know that the idea of mental health stigma is not just a Latinx or, or BIPOC issue. Um, this is, a, this is an, a struggle that we have across the country, um, all populations, including white populations. And so it's really important that we remember that because um, if you look at all the uh, end, end mental health stigma campaigns, um, that, that those are national campaigns, right? If you look at any sitcom, TV drama, mass media, uh, entertainment, uh, unless it's specifically addressing the importance of therapy, um, most of the time the representations almost always are us, you know, um, telling of the stigma that we still see around mental health. So if you look at any TV show, movie, what have you, um, a lot of the times when therapy is brought up, um, people are like, no, like therapy, I don't need therapy, or 
I don't do therapy. And those are all white individuals, you know, that you see that. Um, so mental health stigma is alive and well, of course, in our country, in our society. And, um, and while the stigma does have its particular um, cultural histories for different communities, including ours, like there are different, maybe different reasons. Um, we just have to be careful that we don't unwittingly, again, start to uh, marginalize the Latinx community as, uh, as, as the community with the issue of uh, mental health stigma. Because we do hear that we're like, well, in our culture, we just, you know, we don't, we don't believe in therapy, we don't believe in mental health services, um, which is true. But remember, that's across the board. That's especially in the white population of this country. There's mental health stigma everywhere. Um, if you want to look at regions, particularly in the South and the United States, um, so, but it's everywhere. So we just have to be careful that we don't further further um, add a deficit narrative um, within our community or um, toward the Latinx community about the stigma. Our stigma uh, that's distinct or different uh, from the majority population does center around uh, racial prejudice, marginalization because of our ethnicity, oppression due to our racial and ethnic background so that um, the institutions in, the, in our society over the generations have not always been safe places for us, including the schools, including medical facility, facilities, including government agencies and mental health services. So, so our, our reasons are a little different, but um, I think it's an important thing to make sure that we are aware of. Okay, so, the way I like to begin with um, working with Latinx clients and looking at the, the models that we operate from is starting with the basic foundational model uh, ideas, concepts, constructs that are alive and well in, in, uh, in the field. Um, and that is, um, the notion or the reality that the mental health field is built on the foundation of individualism. Uh, every concept, every approach, every notion that, uh, that has stemmed from um, the latest iteration of mental health, which we, we see as starting with Freud, um, has been built on the worldview of individualism. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with individualism. Uh, it's, not, it's not inherently evil at all. Um, but all I'm saying is that um, we tend not to recognize um, that the field is an, we're basically practicing individualistic mental health, no matter what theory you come from. And that's important because that means that uh, while we do have family therapy, while we do have multicultural um, ideas and notions um, that we try to integrate, uh, those are always still um, iterations of an individualistic foundation. So how do we think of success in therapy? How do we think of progress? What are the main main ideas we think of when we think about somebody who uh, is mentally well and has good mental health. Well, we, you know, we say they have a good self-concept. We have good self-esteem, good self-awareness, all those things you see. All of that is a, uh, is a focus on an individualistic notion of the self. Nowhere in there is there a relational concept right? There's not uh, relational esteem, relational awareness, relational fulfillment, relational discovery. So we're, we are, are essentially working with, um, with just, you know, one worldview. Um, and uh, I think for me, from that stems much of the 
the difficulties we see in the field in trying to connect with um, different cultural populations that don't come from an individualistic worldview, right? And so, um, and so just to be clear, you know, the idea of individualism is just that that is our preference in the world, that um, why we do things, um, what's seen as success is one that um, promotes independence. And collectivism is always looking at what is seen as most important for the betterment of the community. Now, those are two polar opposite views. What I argue is that the majority of our populations, all of us, different ethnicities, um, are, are, are swimming somewhere along this continuum, right? Um, which we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce kind of a way for us to think through that. But every person, every family, every society espouses both individualism and collectivism. You'll see that everywhere. Um, you'll see that in our country, you'll see that in others, is that there's both this balance of what is good for the individual and what is good for the society. Of course, the difference is that at the end of the day, what is the main default? What is the taken for granted assumption? What is the perspective that's most privileged? So in our country, we definitely try to balance the good of the others with the good of the individual. But we know that you know, in, in our laws and our constitution and everything that we see, that ultimately when it comes down to it, what's most important is the rights of privacy or the rights of the individual, right? Um, and so there we can see that um, while we have both our worldview in this, the main you know, ideas of worldviews, for example, in this country, um, lean toward individualism. Right? And so we see you know, the opposite is true with other countries, particularly in the East, right? Um, where they are more collectivistic. Um, so it's a balance, but there are differences, right? So for us, we see that, um, oh, as, I, as I said, you know, almost all the language in mainstream psychotherapy, um, and now that we're talking about it, some of you may have already seen this, but now that we're talking about it, you may be able to go back after, after our webinar and, and see um, all the ways in which individualistic development is, uh, is promoted. Everything that is healthy, everything that's good, tends to align with an individualistic worldview only. Um, separation from family of origin, right? That's the key piece. But we all know also for all, all uh, cultures that maintaining healthy relationships is also key for for healthy development. But that is, we have to know that ourselves. We talk about it in class. It's not in the textbook, right? It's not the key. It's not the point of healthy individual, uh, healthy development. Healthy development is individuation of the self, right? And it doesn't say individu individuation of the self and uh, maintaining healthy relationships throughout the lifespan. That last part isn't there, and that's important. That's exactly what I'm saying, is that even though we may know it, that's not the message that's given. That's not the heart of what is seen as mental health. So um, I invite you, uh, as we go through this, to uh, perhaps in the chat or in the Q&A, however, uh, however it's most, most comfortable for you, um, take a look at this continuum, okay? On the left side are ideas and notions um, that are individualistic. And on the right side are collectivistic notions. You'll note, you'll note that 
the description of each of these on both sides are both healthy descriptions. They're positive. A lot of the times when we look at one of the values on one side, we tend to see the other side and describe the, you know, the other side of the worldview, the other worldview as lacking in um, kind of a deficit or a negative view. But it's important that we are able to see the strengths you know, on, bo on both sides because that's actually, that's actually true. Right? So thinking about your identity, how you think of your identity development and how you think of who you are, do you tend to think of yourself as uh, expressions of how you are distinct from other people, right? Or do you think of yourself uh, as looking at the extent to which you are like your social group, the ways in which you're similar? And you can already see that you probably have both, a little both, like who you are maybe is those unique characteristics of who you are. And if you have important family, cultural group or familial group or that is important to you, um, you also, part of who you are is making sure that you're, that people can tell that you're part of that group, right? The continuum here is to show us that where do you tend, what's a little more important to you? You know, where do you tend to fall most of the time? This I think helps us, um, and we'll look at the other examples fairly quickly, um, but you can use this with ourselves and with clients as well, because this tends to help move us away from, oh, this client's individualistic or this client's collectivistic, right? And when we say that, we tend to think that they don't have or value these other ways of being. And in reality, um, that's not true. It's just the degree to which these are present. Okay. So um, a good one is um, growth and change is valued, right? That's individualism. And then the other side is increasing or maintaining family traditions is valued in identity. Both of them are important. But here's one where we get stuck, especially with some of our Latinx clients that are maybe more collectivistic and we're, we're trying to move them towards some growth and change and that's what they're looking at. But they want to, or it's hard for them or they're holding on to certain familial um, practices or traditions. Um, we may try to um, say like, well, they're, they're holding on to these traditions they really don't value growth and change because they just value those traditions more. Um, well, yes and no, but ne not necessarily. It just may be that they do value growth and change, right? But they also value family traditions. And so um, seeing things on a continuum can help us deconstruct like, okay, where are they exactly? And what are the reasons behind like if they fall more to the right um that's important so um having them describe why they're more to the right but then also where are the points where they are more individualistic um and then it moves us away from a, a dichotomy and moves us more toward a, a dynamic discussion and i think we're going to talk a little bit more about that <clears throat> um so could you please uh, have a question, expand a little bit more on the concept of codependency and cultural implications from this concept of collectivist view? Yes. So from a collectivistic perspective, from a collectivistic perspective, we would start with the concept, of course, of interdependency. Um, and from an individualistic perspective, any notion of the word dependence is seen as a negative, right? Can you think of the word dependence as something healthy at all? When have you used the word dependence as an indication of health? When in actuality, dependence is not negative in and of itself at all. This is a good example of how we are 
um, infused with an individualistic way of looking at mental health, but we just call it mental health. We don't say individualistic mental health. Is it a good thing to have somebody in your life that you can rely on? Is it a good thing that people in your life can rely on you when they need you and you can rely on them when you need them? That's dependence, right? But we only think of dependence in a negative way because we only think of mental health from an individualistic perspective, right? What we need to look at is what are the healthy and unhealthy behaviors of each, right? So um, in what ways are those, those interactions of interdependence healthy and good? In what ways is that relationship or interdependence unhealthy and not productive? It's not the dependency all at once, right? Just like the independence, um, people get cut off from each other. People don't know how to express their connect their emotions. People don't know how to connect with one another in relationships um, because they keep things to themselves because there's an over-reliance on seeing things from their own perspective. And we understand that in the field and we talk about it and we treat it and we talk about you know, we work on communication skills, we work on, we work on emotional um, expression, but we never associate those deficits with individualism, and they are. Those are also individualistic deficits, individualistic unhealthy behaviors, right? We only talk about the cultural aspects of mental health when it's collectivistic, dependency, no boundaries. We don't talk about people that have too much boundaries, right? And they're closed off. We just talk about that as a taken for granted assumption. We don't say, well, see, this is an individualistic worldview, mental health issue. So we need to work on your collectivism. We only talk about collectivism and mental health as, um, and when we talk about collectivism, it's a, we see the negative. And that's because we only see the mental health from an individualistic perspective. Um, as the foundation, right? So I think that's important. Um, each of these can be broken down even further on the, on the continuum, right? Each of these can be broken down further. We can look at um, like the um, not in family, Individualism, not involved. My family's not involved in personal, my personal decisions. At the other end, my family's equally involved in all my personal decisions. Again, these are meant to be polar opposites because the reality is that even if people tend to lean most of the time toward one end, a lot of the times there's some variation. And that's what we're looking for as therapists. We're looking for that, that piece that we can find an in so that we can look at those exceptions. And, and anytime you find an in, a piece here, what you're looking for is you're looking for a thread to then, then, then we enact our skills as a therapist to make that thread into a tapestry. None of this is a, is an automatic answer, right? None of this is a, like, oh, okay, that's the piece that we got. No, it's, it's just a, th a thread that we need to be able to then, you know, craft and just find an opportunity to make that thread into something more meaningful. So, um, if we look at those personal decisions piece, then that can be broken down into like, tell me five significant decisions in your life uh, that were really important to you. And each of those decisions, where did you fall on each of these? Because that breaks that breaks it down even further. Because someone could say, well, I, uh, I'm mostly to the to the left on this. Um, I usually my family's not involved in my personal decisions. That's helpful, right? But that also is a little bit static as well. Because if we break it down into specific decisions, then we can see where they fall in each of those decisions, um, what was different, what was distinct. It, it makes for a more authentic um, expression of one's cultural values. So I think that's important. Okay. Um,
Okay, so this is also a good way to look at the notion of traditionalism, which we know um, we hear often uh, a lot, you know, we, we hear about traditionalism often in work with uh, Latinx brown clients, right? Um, and, and that's that, that sense that um, there are certain cultural values of origin that, um, that certain families and clients um, want to hold on to or, or struggle with. But just like um, some of the other values we see, traditionalism is also portrayed as a as static, right? When in actuality, um, we want to look at traditionalism on a continuum, and so um, from very traditional to you know not traditional, or however we want to put those different poles, uh, where do clients fall on each of these, right? So. Um, so, you know, I think some of you know some of this, you know, down here are some of the suggestions, which is trying to deconstruct what that means for them on this continuum, right? To what degree do they fall on more traditional or, um, <clears throat> or not as traditional? And making sure that, um, that we're able to articulate what some of the strengths are of that traditionalism. Because there's a reason why people hold on to it. There are certain patterns of behavior that get passed down that are unhealthy patterns of behavior over generations, right? Um, so we know that. We also know that those patterns usually started as some type of coping, maybe they were appropriate at a certain time. Uh, maybe that's all the kind of, that's the coping behavior that was available. Um, or maybe the intention of the behavior um, does not match the manifestation of the actual behavior now, right? So we try to look for the intent. Um, but, but there's always some positive origin or positive intent somewhere in most of uh, behaviors that we see that are around traditionalism. So, so if we help locate the strengths of, of the meaning of the, that traditionalism, then we can talk about, well, do the behaviors associated with that, do all these behaviors still have to be present um, for that meaning to still be present, right? Um, and so I think that's where, again, we start trying to find thre threads that may, um, that may, we may be able to, to form into something bigger or newer, right? Uh, Gabriela, what are your thoughts on ethnocentrism? So to me, it depends on uh, ethno, what, eth what eth ethnocentrism, how that's being used. Um, so, <laughs> I've heard it used where it's a way of centering um, one's cultural, ethnic worldview and operating from that center and building on that so that um, that becomes honored and valued. Um, and so that's one way of looking at it. And from that way, I think that that is something that can be useful. Um, but um, but I think I think the more technical I think definition or whatever is that you center a particular ethnic or cultural group, and you only see things from that perspective, and that you feel that that ethnic perspective or cultural perspective is better than others, right? Um, <clears throat> so in that case, that I don't find that as useful or as helpful um, when it's about devaluing something else um, just based on um, um, valuing one's ethnic group over another, um, then it's not as helpful. But, but if it's about using a, a, a approach 
that centers a particular ethnic group in order to find ways to continue to draw from the strengths and the wisdom of that group and that hasn't been done as much or as often then i think that can be helpful um, now let's look at what has become traditional counseling assumptions right um, these are the questions i think that we need to to look at um, What do you or what do the clients or what do we expect from a therapist, right? In terms of behavior um, from our colleagues or from our own therapist, right? What do you or what do we expect from a client? What do we see as the focus of counseling? These are questions that we need to ask ourselves, which maybe you already do, <clears throat> for reflective, um, to position ourselves, to kind of know, okay, where, where are we right now in our practice? Because a, a lot of the times, if we check in with ourselves every five years with these questions, sometimes our answers shift. We don't even realize that our perspectives have shifted a bit. Um, until we check in on this. And so that's important because this helps us look at what are we, what do we consider counseling? What do we consider psychotherapy? What do we consider our role to be? Um, and those are assumptions we walk in with. And um, so we need to, we need to really always be grounded, right? We know that uh, Latinx population, that only about 20% um, that have, you know, what considered symptoms of a psychological disorder, talk to any type of uh, doctor. And usually in this case, we mean a physician and usually in the emergency room. Um, and only about 10% of those um, contacts will be considered a mental health specialist, right? And <clears throat> so that's it's pretty low. Um, so I think, one of the reasons why um, that we're going to touch on a few things is that um, some of these traditional assumptions continue to play out in the field. Um, one is that history isn't relevant. You know, um, it's the here and now. It's where we are. Um, if you're psychodynamic, then 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 history is definitely important to you, right? <laughs> um, but a lot of the times, we we don't see the history of a people, right? We see the personal history of a person as important, but not the history of a people, right? Or the history of a society. And, uh, and for Latinx and Chicanx populations, a lot of the time, the past and the present um, are very much related. So um, we see the, the notion of storytelling um, as a main avenue toward symptom explanation and symptom description. Um, but not valuing historical context also gives the, you know, implicit, sometimes explicit message that, um, that, they, that everything that's going on with a particular client um, is not related to a lot of the systemic and historical inequities that that de definitely show up in the population uh, and communities today. We also see uh, a traditional assumption is that the formality of the session uh, is, is a key piece to success, right? That professional distance between the client and the therapist. It doesn't mean that, you know, we think it, it can't be a warm interaction, right? But that there is this, there is this professional distance. Um, and I'm not saying, uh, I'll talk more about how we wanna kind of connect with that and be more responsive, but as is, you know, that's kind of where we're at a lot of the times. That's not necessarily good, not necessarily bad, but that's a traditional assumption, right? Counseling assumption. We also assume that um, you know verbal openness uh, is more uh, indicative of being in a good place in terms of mental health. 
directed uh, direct communication is more indicative of emotional maturity and um, and being in touch with our what is troubling us and being more self-aware, right? Um, the privileging of accurate over appropriate communication, which has to do with low context and high context cultures. So um, looking somebody in the eye when you're speaking about something is uh, more of that direct, more of that accurate communication. Looking away when you're speaking to somebody is more indirect, you know, and uh, the person receiving it might be, well, are you talking to me? Or are you looking away or what's happening? It's not very accurate, but of course we know that for some people not looking somebody in the eye that has a certain authority, it's appropriate behavior not to look somebody in the eye, right? So we have to look at these behaviors in context, um, but this is, you know, some of the assumptions. Um, we also, of course, I've covered this, I think, you know, um, that the premise of mental health is changing the individual, right? Interventions tend to have an individual focus, right? Um, we don't, don't do too well with relationships and, and relatedness. Um, um, in fact, one of the things that, um, that we talk about a lot of the times in mainstream therapy is when someone's trying to bring in what other people are doing or other things that uh, have led to this issue or other people, um, we say, well, we can't really, we can't change others. We can only, we can only focus on you, right? And I've talked about that in other places where you know, both and, right? That does make sense. And that can be helpful when someone is really, you know, um, maybe not really kind of focusing on what they need to talk with, talk about. But also at the same time, that can also be seen as patronizing. It can also be seen as dismissive, perhaps, with someone that maybe, it, you know, hasn't been able to tell their story. Um, someone that comes from a more collectivistic perspective where you have to talk about relationships also. Um, and, and so we need to find, we need to be more inclusive of that, where what I'm saying is that um, it's not always a bad thing that we have individual interventions, but also that we have to realize that we're only looking at things with one eye and so we need to be aware of expanding our vision, right? Um, okay, uh, and so I see Luz asked a question about um, the diversity within the Latinx population, um, the linguistic diversity um, with monolingual, Spanish monolingual clients were not all Spanish is the same. I, I think um, that's probably a really, I'm just gonna give you a very straightforward answer, Luz, because of time, but you can always contact me afterwards if you'd like. Um, but I think this is a good example where we can implement some of our, you know, our, our, our general counseling skills where we um, always remain curious about what's being said so that we check in on the meaning of certain certain words and certain expressions. And we check in to see if we can deconstruct or have clients expand on what it is they're explaining to us in that moment, instead of like assuming that certain words or phrases mean the same um, with different Latinx populations. And so I, I hope that's a little helpful. I know it's probably very surface for right now, but we can, you're, you're always welcome to reach out to me. Um, so this leads to something that we've been talking about um, that, that, um, that I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, um, which is there are actually ways of interacting within the Brown Latinx communities that 
very much connect with what we now call therapy. Um, and so even though our community has distanced itself from modern day therapy, a lot of the reasons why I've, I've mentioned this because we haven't been represented in the field and the field has many ideas that don't necessarily connect with our worldview. But the heart of what therapy is supposed to be very much uh, connects with both ancestral and current cultural values as a starting point. Um, so, um, so we have certain characteristics that actually lend themselves to the therapeutic process. One of them, which I know we're all familiar with probably, is that um, this idea of platica, right? Platica can be a, a pathway to therapeutic connection, right? Platica is, you know, um, translated probably is this idea that um, of, of maybe what we would consider small talk in English. But platica is more than small talk. It's, it's small talk with heart. It's, you know, because small talk does have its place. There's nothing wrong with small talk. It's, it's, it is what it is. Like you check in, you're making people feel comfortable. You're talking about this and this and that. But platica is that, that discussion, but it's usually more personal, more personable. And that is something that is alive and well. Right. We also have this practice of, it's very similar, of personalismo, which, um, which is the notion that every person in front of us has their own individual story. You know, um, when we say, hey, how are you? How was your day? We're like, oh, fine. And um, that can, again, be appropriate. But personalismo would be no, like really how, what's going on? How was your day? You know, what's been happening? How are you? So it's more uh, connected. Um, it makes the person in front of you feel that they are unique. And isn't that what therapy is supposed to be about, right? Uh, that's one of the key pieces, right? Is that that person's story is distinct and unique. And so in a lot of ways we are trying to espouse that idea of personalismo in our work. But this is something that we see in our community, right? And, and oops, sorry, here we go. And we have talked about this before, the, the sense of collectivism also connects with the sense of interconnectedness. So that yes, we have our own individual healing that we need to do. We have pieces of who we are that we need to handle ourselves and work through ourselves. And also there's a piece of the community, the family, the relationships, the interaction that is also a piece of our healing. Jeffrey Kotler, who's a professor and author for I don't know how many years. And I think he wrote a book about 10 years ago with another, uh, another therapist who I, I'm sorry, I don't remember. I don't remember the name of the book, but um, but I'm sure you can find it. Uh, uh, what they did, a key piece of what they did is they went around the world to a lot of different healers, um, you know, other therapists, other indigenous communities as well. And one of the things that they saw pretty consistently when they were looking at indigenous communities is um, that there was always a piece of the healing process that the community took part in, right? It was always community, drums, fire, um, uh, in addition to the individual work, right? So that's, we see those kind of connections, right? This interconnectedness. So that's where this idea of interdependence, this idea of who got your back in this world, you know, who got your back in a good and healthy way. And those are the people that we need to make sure are part of your healing process. Um,
Another thing that uh, that we see often is um, is that a lot of the times our our style of interaction has a very affective component to it, right? Emotions and connecting in that way we see is prominent in a lot of Latinx communities and families. Um, more so, you know, in general, than more of a cognitive, you know, way of interacting. There's a warmth, um, some very, for some very surface examples might be in some communities, when you greet somebody or even meet somebody, you can either be greeted with a hug or a kiss on the cheek. Um, you know, men or women, doesn't matter. Uh, and, and so that, that's affect, right? That's that sense. Um, that seems to coincide very well with what we espouse, you know, what we, we hope, what we propose that therapy is supposed to be, right? We know that there's a cognitive component of therapy, the changing of the thoughts, but but ultimately there's also a foundation of that emotional affective expression. Well, that's alive and well in the Latinx community. The thing is that these two worlds have not really connected. And, and one of the reasons why is because all of these cultural characteristics that I'm saying uh, that align with therapy, a lot of the times, again, we, we're still dealing with the history of our community that hasn't seen the therapeutic, the mental health institution as a welcoming place to connect. So we, we continue to describe these two areas as very distant and distinct. But if we in the mental health field can continue doing that work of, of shifting and making the institution and the field more welcoming and more connected, then a lot of the cultural characteristics that we see in the Latinx community already, once we kind of make those bridges, we, you know, I'm proposing that um, that those characteristics that align with therapy will benefit um, that process, will benefit the process of, of healing for a lot of our clients. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna just check, let's see. Um, the Latinx community is uh, a diverse group. Of course, we have people from what we call different countries. Um, and so um, there are some aspects and areas that are gonna be more relevant than others. Um, but just like the mental health community um, talks about certain interventions and certain uh, approaches in the field that are, are, are more common threads, that's the way I'm approaching some of the, uh, the areas that I'm talking about here. I'm looking at some of the areas that are more common threads within the Latinx communities um, more so than the distinctions, right? So, um, so if you, um, if you, if you're trained as a, as a counselor, I know we have different mental health fields, but, um, they use the core conditions, which is basically Rogers, right? Rod Roger, Roger, Rogerian ideas, right? As the core conditions of counseling, you know, you need to build rapport, you need to whatever. Um, and so they're trying to find common threads that apply. So it's the same way in talking with cultural groups. You know, we of course acknowledge diversity within group, but we're also looking at the common threads. And for me, the common threads are those um, aspects that connect to our uh, indigenous perspectives of how to look at life and interactions. And those perspectives that we see that have developed over the years, over the centuries that um, that primarily value more collectivistic ways of, of interacting and of healing. Right? So, um, so how do you manage a session if a client may view the counselor negatively for not being born in a Latinx country? Okay, that's a good one. So um, I think, this is, again, sometimes, um, sometimes we can look back on some of our basic foundational 
counseling 101 type of training for some of this. And so this is a good one where, um, so if we know that, for example, um, a client comes to us and they are struggling with frustration and anger, um, then sometimes that can be difficult because we're trying to deal with ang their anger and they put their anger toward us. Um, and we, we know like our, our natural inclination a lot of times could be defensive. We could have some defensiveness. Um, but but what a lot of the times what's most appropriate is to let the client have that anger, let it you know move its way through, try to connect with um, being a, a safe space, holding space for the client, being supportive, validating their frustration, validating their feelings, validating their anger, um, so that there's some kind of connection built, right? Uh, similarly, if we are perhaps uh, like if you were a younger clinician and you had someone that was much older and they may start like questioning, well, how long have you been doing this? What are your credentials? I'm not sure I feel comfortable. Again, another area where we may feel defensive, but of course we try to validate concerns. We don't try to, um, to you know, um, we try not to give into that defensiveness um, that we may feel um, and, and respond point by point. We try to look at the deeper issue of that sense of insecurity that the client may have. So all this is similar to somebody maybe seeing you as not connected with their ethnic group, right? It's like, okay, well, same thing, right? Same way, you try to validate that sense of unsureness maybe that sense of maybe you won't you won't understand me you don't answer it by trying to say well i you know i have you know taken all kinds of diversity courses and you know you just listen and validate and try to build trust with the client so i think that's a this is very similar to how we would handle um other other insecurities or, or sense of frustration that clients have for different reasons as well okay so um, so browning the counseling, this is something, so this is kind of a culmination of some of the things that I have been talking about. Um, so we try to build rapport and respect, honor the respect. So the rapport building is um, trying to make sure that the client feels comfortable but we also know that clients, a lot of Latinx clients may come to us and they may um, show us a lot of respect for having, for having this professional position, right? And what we try to do in our mental health training that again is very much influenced by our sense of egalitarianism in a very Western individualistic way. We always try to like, lower the, that that hierarchy that, that exists, right? To try to be more connected with our clients. And so there are definitely important reasons why we do that, you know, healthy reasons that across the board, we, we try not to um, make that distinction more like that we, 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 but we try to connect. But at the same time, egalitarianism may, doesn't always have to always mean like that we have to be seen at the same level all the time with our clients, because some clients may come in with like, no, there's a, there is a certain degree of respect that, that I see in you as the clinician. And so, so that's okay. I mean, we, we don't want to, um, we want to be able to hold both of those, those ways of interacting um, because we want to honor their cultural perspective, right? Which is very similar to what I was talking about earlier where we honor both appropriate communication as well as accurate communication. It may be more appropriate for the client to speak more indirectly. You know, like, you know, I, you know, the very, you know, lighthearted kind of example out in the real world, the real world that we see sometimes and is that like, oh, I, you know, I have a friend that's having this issue. And so I'm only asking for my friend, you know, that is going through this. Um, when the person's talking about themselves, right? So in the mental health field, we almost all, almost always like 
you can like, okay, well, let's bring this to you, right? Like you're not talking about your friend, you're talking about you, like how can we get you to, um, and so we're always pushing for that accurate communication. Now, both and accurate communication is crucial. We some we some a lot of the times we need to know exactly what we're talking about, and especially when it comes to safety, right? But also, also, um, it doesn't always mean that immediately we need to move into accurate communication and that speaking indirectly is always unhealthy always avoidant, always resistant. No, sometimes that's culturally appropriate. Um, it's culturally appropriate for someone to speak in that indirect way so that they can share their story, so they can share their story without shame or guilt, so that they that, that they don't, um, they, they can see if there's some trust, that they can trust you, right? Um, and remember, uh, someone from a collectivistic perspective may assume that you already know that that's what they're doing right um <clears throat> and so uh so both we need to recognize um both the importance of indirect and direct communication that both can be valid both can be useful um that direct communication by default is not necessarily always healthier and that's again another way that we look at mental health from an individualistic perspective without realizing that it's an individualistic perspective. And, and that balance of formality and personalized attention that we're talking about, you know, that um, we don't wanna be over-professionalized, right? Which we know already, right? Um, but also we don't wanna be that super, always super laid back, um uh therapist to the degree that we have a client in front of us that may not connect with that if if you um are a therapist and your clients are also share very similar in your worldview and your sense of egalitarianism and like doing therapy in a real then it's going to work perfect you know it's going to it's going to be great it's all about cultural responsiveness Right. But if you have a client that, you know, um, that may not connect, then then they don't then we need we need to kind of meet them where they're at in terms of um, how well they feel that this interaction is being respectful of how they see this relationship. So uh, let's see. Um, Brian says, what is the critical cultural vantage point of bilingual recovery pathways associated with chronic health? I'm not sure exactly the question, Brian, I don't know if you wanna um, put it in the chat in a different way. Um, the importance of bi bilingualism maybe I'm, I apologize, Brian. Um, for some reason, I'm not kind of connecting exactly with the question, so I'm sorry, but it, I welcome you to either re restate it or, or email it to me and I can try to connect with it. Um, how do we use differences as a strength? Uh, I, anytime we we always look a lot of the times when we're trying to look for strengths and in, in differences. For me, it's looking at the intention, trying to discover what the intent is behind the behavior or what some of the benefits have been in other contexts. Um, that was, that's a, you know, one, one way to try to see where those, those strengths may be. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to, I'm looking at the chat now. Okay. Okay. So another way uh, is looking at the way we offer our, 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 uh, our services or our help offering behavior. Um, we talk a lot about the help seeking behavior of client populations that don't often come to therapy. Um, so that we can connect with that and try to make services more available to them. Um, and that's important. 
But we also need to look at the help offering behavior that we have, which is um, what I'm proposing is that sometimes with certain clients, we need to be more affirmative in our, in our offering of this space as a safe space. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to um, be more directive, but, but spend more time being a little more affirmative. Um, because um, we, we tend to, I think, want to make sure that the client knows that this is their space, that um, we're going to talk about what they need to talk about. Um, whatever they need to talk about is fine. And a lot of the times clients are hesitant to, to really talk about the issue or to trust us. And so we try to make it clear, like, no, this is a really safe space, but we stay here and we'll stay here, right? And we, we're, we want the client to come meet us, like, you know, like, no, this is a safe place and we're waiting. And the client sometimes is hesitant. Sometimes that hesitancy to come to us in that middle space if they're a Latinx client or, or a, a client that um, is not associated, has a good association with the therapeutic process, um, then we, we keep saying, no, this is a safe place. This is good. You can say whatever, you can do whatever you want. I'm here for you, it doesn't matter. And like, okay, no, I'm not sure. Um, and then like they leave or they don't come. And they were like, well, I guess they weren't ready, right? Maybe, uh, maybe not. That's particularly true from someone from an individualistic perspective, right? Because that expectation is I have to meet somebody in the middle. Like you do your part, I do my part. Um, but from a collectivistic perspective and from a perspective where you have a client population that's not as familiar with the mental health institution or, or, or the field, then sometimes it's not enough to like say and wait for them. Sometimes we have to kind of take, see if we can take them a little bit with us, um, which is, um, really be more affirmative and say, no, you know, I know it's difficult or anytime, anything you have to say is the most important thing for you to say right now. You are the person that I have all my attention on right now. Um, I know it may seem like what you have to say is either too much. Sometimes they feel that, or it's too silly because a lot of the times they're like, I, you probably have people that have much more difficult problems than what I want to talk about sometimes. That's what they're feeling. Um, and the quick story that I have about that is, um, um, have you ever been to somebody's house um, where the first thing you do when you come into their house, and it's usually an elder, is they offer to feed you, right? I, and um, they'll almost sometimes even just sit you down sometimes and put a plate in front of you. And it doesn't matter if you say, well, no, that's okay. I'm not hungry. No, I appreciate it. That's okay. And you're like, no, 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 come down, sit down, you know, have something to come sit down. Blah, blah, blah. It's not that they're ignoring, ignoring you or they're disregarding you. If you're saying, no, that's okay. You're being polite. Um, a lot of the times it's because that's who they are. That's what they're going to, that's how they are, a hus you know, show their hospitality um as a person in this world right so they're going to continue to offer you that plate of food right um and so if that type of person comes to you as a client they may not even realize this you know it's not a, an explicit thought that they have in their head but somewhere in their unconscious they're expecting you to have that same type of help offering behavior because that's what they would do right as a therapist and it's not an expectation like i'm judging you about you know no, it's the, no it's not even aware of it a lot of the times but so so that type of, of person in some ways is going to expect you to continue to put that plate of therapy in front of them you know even if they say no that's okay because they're being polite right it's like no no really right i you know so um i have much more to say about about that but i know that we have limited time i think we just have um a few more minutes right so i think i am let me see and people i thank you all so much for sharing questions along the way as you have i think that's the best way to do it in comments um i talked about platica um uh, i have talked about the importance of identity 
and finding ways to connect with that component. We've talked about this in other ways, the idea of interdependence as an important piece. Um, Lillian Comas Diaz, who's a Puerto Rican psychologist, I forgot to put her in there. She talks about this idea of not just agency, but co-agency, which I think is representative of kind of this interdependent uh, or pro-dependence, as some people have called it, kind of framework. Right. One thing that we didn't get to talk too much about is the notion of spirituality, um, which again, may or may not necessarily be religion, um, but, um, but is this idea uh, a lot of the times is a, uh, as we say here, it's kind of a, a combination of current, um, for the majority of Latino population, some type of Christian base, um, not always, of course, but uh, but also there is a, a lot of um, indigenous, from the various indigenous peoples, uh, concepts that have integrated into um, religious or spiritual practices. Um, and a lot of the times we see these in family spiritual practices, not necessarily institutions um, like, like the church or certain churches that are more formal, but more in, the, in family ways of practicing. Um, and, so, um, and so one of the things that I think is important um, is, of course, recognizing the variations of degrees of connectedness to spirituality. Um, some it's very consistent, some it's, you know, off and on, some don't have, you know, some folks don't have any connection to spirituality, right? Um, but some, qu some questions, you know, to start with, I think, um, maybe, um, what are our thoughts on some of these aspects here? So. Um, if we're going to talk about spiritual issues or spirituality comes up and we may not have the same spiritual background or we don't want to impose or we're trying to find a way to connect, um, then sometimes we can just look at some, some very important relational key pieces in looking at um, uh, how people may heal. So something that we may ask ourselves are like, what is our belief in the idea of forgiveness, right? Instead of connecting it specifically to a spiritual practice or religious practice, just the idea of forgiveness, right? If you can kind of talk through and connect with that, that might be um, ways in which that can transcend or connect meaningfully, if that's something that comes up. Um, what's your belief on the basic nature of people? You know, do we believe people are, basically good, not good, um, neither. Right? Um, what about evil or darkness or negativity, you know, in a person's life? Um, can that be moved if we bring in healthiness or goodness or light? Um, so, so I think these kind of questions help us reflect on some of the, mm -hmm. the ways in which we can connect with spiritual themes without necessarily having to be from the same spiritual background or, or imposing or making assumptions. So these are just a few examples and some of you may have, have more. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop. Um, I, I know we could go through the very, very end, but I'm just gonna pause here and see um, if there are any final comments or questions. Like, I could talk about the four elements right now, but I don't think we have time. Um, I think I'll leave you with this, which is, I know a lot of the, the things we do with webinars, which is important, and I do this sometimes, which is um, what are the takeaways, right? Uh, hopefully there are some takeaways for you. Um, but I also like to ask, more so than the takeaways, what are, which are like, this is what I got from it. Like maybe what are the things that you see growing in your, in your practice? Um, what are the, the inklings of the ideas 
that you're you're thinking about that that may grow into something that may impact your practice. So I think I'll leave you with, with those reflections and um, and I'd like to thank you all um, for listening to me kind of go through this um, webinar with you. Um, maybe sometimes talking a little too fast with those examples. I, I'm always excited to kind of share this information. So I, I hope that um, I hope that it leaves you with something to think about. Um, please know that you can uh, you can contact you can contact me at any point, and I'm I'm happy to answer um, to answer any questions you may have. Um, uh, you can reach me at uh, info at rasapsychology.org. Or you just look up rasapsychology.org. Um, contact you can contact me. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so so much, Manuel.